live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. So, the Los Angeles Rams are playing the Super Bowl in their home city. Feels weird that after going 54 years without a team ever playing a Super Bowl in its home venue, we now have had this happen in back-to-back -back years. Having visited SoFi myself, I can say that the stadium lives up to the hype and then some, and I have no doubts that Los Angeles is going to put on a great show. At the very least, it can't be any worse than the last time the Rams played a Super Bowl in Southern California. Because holy cow, the last time the Rams did this and played in front of their home fans, it was an absolute disaster. Even though prior to Super Bowl 55, no team ever played the Super Bowl in their home stadium, there were some instances where a team played the game in their region. You saw this in Super Bowl 19 with the San Francisco 49ers playing at Palo Alto in Stanford, a mere 30 miles away from the city. And you saw this at Super Bowl 14 when the Los Angeles Rams played the Pittsburgh Steelers at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, less than 14 miles away from the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum where they played their home games. Most people remember this Super Bowl as a great game and remember it fondly for setting the all-time attendance record, which is a record that it still holds today. But what you might not realize is that in actuality, off the field, this game was a disaster. Pasadena was in no way, shape, or form ready or able to host this Super Bowl. Even though it's forgotten more than 40 years later, and no one talks about just how big of a train wreck the Super Bowl was, you could make the argument that outside of Super Bowl IX in New Orleans, where they didn't even have the stadium ready, this might have been the worst run Super Bowl of all time. Yes, even worse than Super Bowl 45, when Cowboys Stadium sold tickets that did not exist. And this is the story behind one of the biggest disasters and poorest run Super Bowls of all time. Before I talk about all the incidents that happened, and trust me, there were a lot of them, we need some context to understand the game itself, as well as Pasadena's prior history with the Super Bowl, because especially when it comes to their prior hosting history, it becomes extremely relevant when one of the major problems was the exact same problem that happened beforehand. Entering Super Bowl 14 over in the AFC, you had the Pittsburgh Steelers, who were putting together one of the greatest dynasties in the history of the sport. No longer were the Steelers the laughing stock of the country like they were at the start of the 70s, by the time the 70s ended, they were the most formidable team in football. They won three Super Bowls in a five-year stretch, including the most recent one at Super Bowl 13 against the Dallas Cowboys, in a game that, at the time, was undoubtedly the greatest Super Bowl ever played. And they were looking to make it 4-6 and six and extend their hold on the record for most Super Bowl wins by one team. They were 12-4, and four, boasting the best record in football. And aside from having a great defense, they were destroying teams offensively, with the team scoring the most points in the league at 416, and with the team having the second best point differential in football at plus 154, only behind the San Diego Chargers at plus 165. As a side note, to learn more about that 1979 Steelers team, click the card in the upper right corner. And their opponent was, well on paper, it was the worst Super Bowl opponent of all time, and at the very least, the worst since the merger. Many people say that the 1979 Rams were the worst team to ever make it to the Super Bowl, and it's not entirely hard to see why. Los Angeles finished the season with a record of just 9-7, only making the playoffs because no other team in the NFC West finished above 500. Their offense was led by quarterback Vince Ferragamo, who in his career up until the playoffs had completed just 48% of his passes for 7 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, and a passer rating of 51.4. You think of all the great quarterbacks in NFL history who never start in the Super Bowl, and then you realize that Vince Ferragamo somehow did. Not only did they have the worst winning percentage of any team to make the Super Bowl, but at the time, their point differential of plus 14 was the worst by a comfortable margin of any team to make it to the big game. And it didn't help that not only were they 5-6 and six through 11 weeks, but in their final game of the regular season, which was the last time they played in Los Angeles, they got booed off the field after losing 29-14 to the New Orleans Saints. Yet here they were in the Super Bowl. Pittsburgh entered the game as a heavy favorite, but there were tons of storylines taking place off the field. First, you had Rams offensive tackle Doug France openly giving his fans the middle finger and saying that their support of the team is awful. You can learn more about that PR nightmare by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But you also have the fact that this was the first time ever that a team would be playing the Super Bowl in its home market. And when you have the Rose Bowl, a high-capacity venue, alongside that, well, you're going to have the makings of a great off-the-field performance, where you're going to smash the attendance record and further the Super Bowl as a cultural phenomenon in the United States, unlike anything that we've ever seen before. So with all those factors coming into play, the last thing Pasadena and the NFL could do here was mess up. There was too much riding on this and too many people were involved to have anything big go wrong. Take a wild guess as to what happened during this game. Before I talk about Super Bowl XIV, let's flash back three years in time to Super Bowl XI, because this is where the first problem with the Super Bowl held in 1980 comes into play. Super Bowl XI was the first time ever that the Super Bowl was held in Pasadena. 
Playing the game in Pasadena was seen as somewhat of a risk, especially since the NFL had hosted two Super Bowls before in Los Angeles, with both of those being at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. So they knew that venue well, compared to the Rose Bowl, a venue that hadn't hosted NFL games with frequency before. Plus, the actual Rose Bowl game took place eight days before on January 1st, 1977, and Super Bowl XI was the earliest Super Bowl ever, taking place on January 9th. It was a relatively quick turnaround, and I'm not sure how many people thought that the game would be a success. However, the Super Bowl seemed to go off without a hitch. It smashed the attendance record, with over 103,438 spectators attending the game. And there didn't seem to be too many problems. That was, except for one big one. The Rose Bowl is notorious for how bad their parking situation is. Not that it's necessarily easy to find quality parking anywhere in Los Angeles or nearby, but at the Rose Bowl in particular, it is somewhat of a disaster. There were only 16,000 parking spots available by the stadium, which is not a lot. And that number was about to shrink even more, because as it turns out, the Rose Bowl cannot handle rain well. When it rains and the ground is too wet, some parking lots are unusable, and nearby facilities, such as any golf courses or baseball diamonds, were too wet to park a car on. Sure enough, even though it didn't rain during the game, because there was rain in the forecast during the weekend, the parking lot situation was an absolute nightmare. Of the 16,000 parking spots that people thought would be available, only 9,000 of them were, meaning that if you couldn't get one of the just 9,000 spots available for over 100,000 people, you had to park in a residential area or walk upwards of 14 miles just to get to the stadium. No, that is not an exaggeration. You had to do more than half a marathon's worth of work just to sit down in the venue. You know, it's always a good sign when a spokesman for the Pasadena Police said, we're suggesting people start for the game at 8 o'clock a.m. to make sure they don't miss any of it. I heard there are some tour buses scheduled to leave Los Angeles Airport at 11 a.m. for the game. Good luck to them. So after that debacle, you think that when the NFL awarded Pasadena the Super Bowl three years later, that something would change to prevent this embarrassment from happening again. But nope, you'd be dead wrong. The crazy part about this entire situation of Super Bowl XIV isn't even that things didn't get better or didn't improve. It's that, amazingly enough, they actually got worse. Pasadena officials didn't stop to think to themselves, hey, wait a minute, what if it rains and we're in trouble with parking like we were three years ago? In fact, the solution that they came up with was to reduce the number of parking spots available. Of the 19,000 parking spots available at the Rose Bowl, 15,000 of them were unpaved. While unpaved spots are not a problem if it's sunny, if there's rainfall, obviously, you can't have cars parked there. It would mess up the land. So if you thought that 9,000 available spots at Super Bowl XI was bad, try cutting that number by more than 50%. Because for Super Bowl XIV, in a game that set the attendance record with over 103,000 people pouring through the gates, a mere 4,000 parking spots were available. And it wasn't like this was speculation that it was going to rain and make the parking spaces unusable. No, this was legit. The National Weather Service and forecaster Don Gales predicted that there would be a 60% chance of rain in the days leading up to the game, with Pasadena projected to get anywhere from a quarter of an inch to upwards of half of an inch. In other words, these unpaved parking spots were going to be completely useless. Gales said on the parking situation in the unpaved spots, I read that they want two days to dry out, but I think we can give them only one day. In other words, unless you're one of the lucky ones, or you get there super early, good luck finding parking. Enjoy having to park on people's yards, in front of their houses, and enjoy having to walk upwards of 14 miles just to get to the game. Now all of this sounds horrible, and you'd be right. This sounds like incredibly poor planning on the part of Pasadena and the part of Rose Bowl officials that three years after this exact problem happened and was publicized, that the problem would find a way to get worse. However, if this was the only thing that happened, then I'd be hard-pressed to call this Super Bowl a disaster from an off-the-field standpoint. Parking is a hassle at most places. And even if this situation isn't exactly ideal, if nothing else happened, then this would just be a forgotten footnote in the history of the Super Bowl. It's not like people had trouble getting to the game because the NFL sold duplicate copies of tickets, right? Well, prepare yourselves for some absolute incompetency. More so than at other Super Bowls, if Super Bowl XIV was notorious for anything, it was people stealing tickets off of each other. Forget ticket scalping. Ticket stealing was running rampant in Pasadena and in Los Angeles. Heck, this even impacted Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Terry Bradshaw. To make a long story short, while Bradshaw was autographing items for a fan that came up to him, someone yanked his arm and stole the 16 tickets that he had to the game to give to his family and friends. To learn more about that, click the card in the upper right corner. Basically, no one was safe. Not even the biggest star player in all of football was immune from these ticket thieves. Things got so bad that at one point, a man got beaten up by a group of men in the restroom who then proceeded to steal his ticket. The NFL realized this and they didn't want to reward the ticket thieves and punish the people that had their tickets taken from them. So the NFL rectified the situation. 
or at least they tried their best to rectify the situation by giving away an additional 200 tickets to those that had their tickets stolen from them. Now, I'm not going to go into the fire hazard implications that this poses, because last time I checked, there is no standing room section at the Rose Bowl, so you're just squeezing in an additional 200 people without having any idea where they'll be or having any space for them. However, suppose you were one of the people who had their tickets stolen. You get one of these duplicate tickets and think to yourself that it's still unfair that you now have to stand for the whole three and a half hours, presumably in a worse spot than where your seat was. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to go to where your original seat was. And that's what most of the 200 people did. Naturally, unless one of the people involved is a small infant, two people can't sit in the same seat. So when the thieves came to the seat that they stole, or vice versa, and the people with the original tickets went to the seats that they bought and obtained legally without committing a crime, you had a bunch of people with the same seat. And how do you think the dispute between who got the seat was determined? If you think that it was determined by having the thief apologize, admit their mistake, shake hands with the person, strike up a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with them about their family and their profession, and then buy them a drink for the trouble and the hassle that they caused, congratulations! You're an idiot! They were determined by fights. Lots and lots of fights. In fact, fighting seemed to be a pretty common theme throughout the game in the stands. Whether it was just escalating tensions between the two sets of fans, general drunkenness, the ticket fiasco, or a combination of everything. Even Sergeant Don Silverman, when asked about how many fights there were, said that there were lots of them, to the point where at the end of the game, over 100 people were arrested. So yeah, this was a disaster. And the crazy part, despite all of this, Pasadena still got to host future Super Bowls. I'm not even getting into all the other crazy things that happened during this, such as ticket scalpers doing their thing, and people committing robberies on RVs parked outside the stadium and breaking into the homes of people who were located near the stadium. However, I do find it funny that Lieutenant Chris Haggerty said that most of the arrests were in a category called Things Related to the Super Bowl. Because of course, people beating each other up over tickets and people robbing homes is just something that happens and is inevitable anytime the Super Bowl comes into town. I don't think a single thing about this game went right from an off-the-field standpoint. Fortunately, at the very least, the game itself was really good. This might have been the best of the first 14 Super Bowls played, and if it's not, it's definitely in the top three. Despite the Rams being heavy underdogs, they actually led it 13 to 10 at the half, and led it 19 to 17 at the end of three quarters. They were 15 minutes away from pulling off one of the biggest upsets in the history of the sport and stunning one of the greatest dynasties of all time. However, Pittsburgh scored the final 14 points of the game and prevailed 31 to 19 in a game that was much closer than the final scoreline may indicate. In many ways, it was similar to Super Bowl 44 with how the second half played out. Even though off the field, everything about this game was a disaster, on the field and in the TV ratings, the game was a resounding success. But perhaps the craziest part about all of this is that despite everything bad that happened at this game, Pasadena still got to host two more Super Bowls, hosting Super Bowl 21 in 1987 between the New York Giants and the Denver Broncos, and Super Bowl 27 in 1993 between the Dallas Cowboys and the Buffalo Bills. They haven't hosted a Super Bowl in nearly 30 years, and they're probably never going to host another one again, especially now that SoFi is in the mix. But it's kind of remarkable that they even got two more cracks at the big game after just how awful Super Bowl 14 was. So regardless of what happens in Super Bowl 56, I highly doubt that it could be any worse than the last time the Rams technically hosted the Super Bowl. Because instead of fans watching this game on a bed of roses, at Super Bowl 14, with all the hassle that they had to go through, it seemed more like a bed of nails. Get your official Jaguar Gamer 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel, your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.